Thanks for everybody for attending today. We're looking forward to this uh, discussion and, and we have a, a great lineup of presenters. Uh, this is gonna be a panel discussion on empowering the future of game industry, um, strategies for success. And today we brought together a group of experts from across education, government, industry, and nonprofits to discuss three pillars um, that we think are essential for building a strong and thriving game community. The three pillars that we're gonna focus on are number one, evolving technology and empowering creators. Number two, building a strong talent pipeline. And number three, designing skills, competencies, and certification for game industry success. And throughout, ex throughout exploring these pillars and the various strategies to support them, we hope to inspire some new ideas and uh, come back next year and learn from you all as you em empower your creators in your communities. But first, we want to take a moment to, to introduce our panelists. Uh, so we're going to start. I'm going to give a brief introduction and then allow them to, to introduce themselves, talk about what they're, they're wonderful at, and I uh, hope you can learn, meet them all. First, we're going to start with Leah Jones-Harvey. She's the Associate Commissioner of Workforce Development and Educational Initiatives at the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Aaliyah, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your work in the game industry? Thank you all for being here. Good morning. We are, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, New York City has decided to make a major investment in the game industry um, over the last four or five years. We've been uh, trying to understand the ecosystem in New York City and how we can best support it. Uh, my background is a, a, a windy road to this space. Um, <clears throat> math and, and engineering was my education, um, and then worked in consumer products at Procter & Gamble, marketing, um, all of the brands that we love. Um, <clears throat> came to New York for business school, moved into finance, worked at hedge funds for some time, and then, uh, <clears throat> um, and then took a voyage into the arts through theater. So... A part of my life is spent producing Broadway shows, um, and the other half of my life is spent working for the city of New York, um, trying to uh, <clears throat> build and diversify the workforce in the media and entertainment space. And when we decided to go into games, um, the first thing that we discovered is that 56% of the gamers in New York City are independent. They're not working for um, the AAA, AA studios or um, the corporate um, development teams. They're working for themselves. And so we have spent our time um, trying to understand how we could engage corporate and how we can better, best support those indie developers that are thriving in our city. So that's a little of me. Thanks, Aaliyah. Appreciate it. Now we're going to, uh, next on our panel is Gordon Bellamy. Gordon's a professor of practice of cinematic arts at USC and a veteran of the game industry. Gordon, can you please take a couple minutes and introduce yourself? Oh, okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say it's great to be back. Like, I've been coming to GDC for like 25 years. It's just wonderful to be back together, like with you and, and with everyone out here. You sort of appreciate it when it gets taken away from you, how important it is to have collegial spaces, you know, to like to lift each other up, to even see people who, you know, care about the same things you care about. Um, let's see, about me, um, let's see what matters. So I'm a professor at USC. Um, I also lead a nonprofit called Gay Gaming Professionals. I find myself at the intersection um, a, lot, a lot of these efforts. Um, we work with, with Microsoft and Urban Arts Unity um, on both curricular programs, you know, at USC, but also on scholarship programs to build the talent pipeline to, uh, to um, give um, what it is to come from a good family to all children, you know, that chance to iterate and learn. And that's usually programming um, like our scholars program with GDP, like the system program with Urban Arts where you have the chance to iterate, to learn, uh, to be here. Our scholars are all here at GDC. You know, and you can imagine what a, um, not even advantage, but how supplemental that would be to feeling like you um, belong in the game industry versus you've broken in to like some sort of space. Um, 
personally, my career uh, started. I was an at and scholar at Harvard, and then I went to EA out of school. I designed a game Madden football for a couple years. Um, we had our own studio called Z-Axis that we sold to Activision. Um, I, think it mattered. I ran the IGDA for the world. I ran the AIS. Um, worked for Tencent. That matters to you um, for North America. Um, but now I find purpose in helping people get from point A to point B who don't know how. And, and in cultivating this next generation to be able to live this life that I've had the privilege to lead. So, you know, we can talk more about it, but really it is about, you know, how do we all do that? I think that's why you're all here at 10 a.m. So, anyway, hi. <laughs> well, no, real talk, right? And you found each other. You know, I'll say it one thing. You should all add each other on LinkedIn because this is your family. You should add each other today if you're here. Awesome. Thank you, Gordon. Great to have you. And uh, next, Jessica Lindell, <laughs> um, the Global Head of Social Impact and Education at Unity. Jessica, could you take a moment to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thank you. So well said, Gordon, on the gratitude side. Um, thanks to all of you. I think you're the most hardcore. It's like Friday at 10 a.m. And I'm really grateful that all of you are here for this conversation. Um, just a quick background on me. I've spent my entire career focusing on um, access to quality education and economic opportunity. About halfway through my career, I realized that all the people I'm trying to support are playing video games, so I should probably just go work <laughs> in the video game industry. And I had the incredible privilege to work with MJ, who has to raise his hand, um, who taught me everything I know a little over 10 years ago um, on the, the game industry. Um, and we were uh, building a company, the Games Learning and Assessment Lab, that we built on Unity. And what we learned in that experience was that all the young people would, were so psyched to play these video games that they were already playing for learning, but they were even more excited to like rip them up and try and mod them. And I realized that that pathway into career opportunities was incredibly accessible, engaging, didn't require a four-year degree and something I wanted to be a part of. So I went um, to Unity about six years ago, built out our in-school programs, primarily high schools and universities. Um, kind of traditional pathways in schools into careers. Um, we'll reach about a million students this year around the world who are learning Unity. And then we also built out our upskilling and reskilling programs. Um, so that's about half a million adults who are upskilling and reskilling into Unity careers. And then a few years ago, um, built out our social impact work. So ESG, net zero, climate commitment. Um, but the part I love the most is working with um, I think everyone on this panel <laughs> in that role and really how do we bring together an ecosystem approach to be able to unlock opportunities for underrepresented creators. Thank you. Gosh, so well said. Thank you so much, Jessica. And finally, Philip Courtney. Philip is the, the leader and CEO of Urban Arts, an arts and technology organization, nonprofit organization that teaches digital, digital game design to underrepresented communities. Philip, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, Josh. Hey. I had quite a few nightmares about this panel last <laughs> night. Um, none, of, none of those nightmares have come to pass yet, so that's good. Uh, my name is Philip Courtney. I'm the CEO of Urban Arts. Um, we teach, as Josh said, uh, underrepresented students is the uh, art and science of, of game development through coding, animation, music, storytelling, all of that. Um, I come from uh, traditionally as a, as a teaching artist, as a teacher in a more broad artistic setting. Six years ago as an organization, we decided to zero in on game development, game design, and shared the other art forms like dance and poetry, nothing against those art forms, and really zero in on uh, this the, the, the gaming uh, aspect because we are all about economic mobility for our young people and uh, We thought that that was the best uh, bet for them to really uh, get a seat at the table um, in this industry, so um, We teach the students these amazing skills. We uh, we are a college access program for now Obviously college isn't everything, but um, we prepare our students with as, as Gordon said uh Private, we like to think of it as private school level college access services. The, the same services that someone would get going to a private school, they receive, the students receive in our program, and that's uh, an amazing thing. And they, they go to college and they, uh, they've earned $12 million in scholarships to date. So that's important to graduate without debt, number two. And number three, Jessica Lindell sitting to my right, we connect our alumni to mentorship and internship opportunities in the field. And so those are the three pillars of our work. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Philip. 
I'll, uh, introducing myself, my name is Josh Reynolds. I'm what's called a modern workplace director at Microsoft in our US education team. I lead our East Coast software business, um, but that also gives me an opportunity to also chase passions and understand how we can empower folks um, within education. I've had a unique opportunity to work with very large school districts, uh, universities, and government and industry partners to, to unlock what, what what can be accomplished within education and throughout the pandemic you know we really um we really want to explore the intersection of education and gaming looking at three three different pieces of that the first one is curriculum so leveraging gaming as a platform for game-based learning to engage learners to help students uh, achieve their outcomes number two competition um, using competition to facilitate uh, interaction between students and, and build community. And, and finally, creators and using technology and working across industries, agencies, and education institutions to empower creators. Um, so this is just a dream come true to have a, a, a panel like this to really ideate on where we're at and what's the art of the possible to help build that future um, generation of game developers. With that, Let's get into our, our agenda. The three pillars that we're gonna talk about, the first one is evolving technology and empowering creators. And we're gonna talk about some recent technologies that have uh, come to pass and, and how we, we think about in integrating them. Uh, the second one is what do we need to do to work across these various agencies and institutions to build a strong talent pipeline. And finally, we're gonna think about skills and certifications and how that could be a bridge to designing for game success. So with that, we're gonna jump into the first topic, which is evolving technology and empowering creators. In his book, Hit Refresh, uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, highlights the importance of embracing technology and processes to drive innovation and progress. <laughs> The games industry is constantly evolving with new technologies like cloud, streaming, AI, if you've heard of that in the last couple of months, and, uh, and ML, challenging game development and pushing the industry to reinvent itself. Um, in our first pillar, we're gonna talk about evolving technology and empowering creators um, to understand the new skills, competencies, principles that we should follow in order to take these new technologies and integrate them into what we're doing. The first prompt that I'm going to I'm going to give is to Jessica and Gordon specifically. Um, at, so when we think about how emerging technologies like cloud streaming AI change the landscape of game, game development and education, what impact do you think these technologies will have on skills and competencies needed to keep the industry moving? And how do you think about that with your programming? You want to go first? No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I can jump. You know what? You no. You first. Or, okay, you want me to go first. Okay. All right. So um, that's why you asked. Okay. I accept. Thank you. Um, quick thing, and I was thinking about it as you were introducing about the importance of, of, of pipeline and context for these things, like having a place to learn, having these settings to learn. So me, Gordon, I go, well, how do I get on the stage? I go, oh, I'm smart. And I go, no. Like, so when I was 12, we won this thing called Math Counts. Have you ever heard of Math Counts? We won it. Right? But that started a whole series of cascading events where like, I went to, to math, I went to TIP and to CTY. And then they sent me to Governor's School, then to RSI. Then I went to Exeter, then to St. Paul's. All before going to college, like certification and settings which were specifically for learning specific skills um, are so important for young people. Um, today, like for streaming, we'll talk about that first, um, more people watch games than play them. So understanding the ecosystem of how um, data and games and experiences are moved around and distributed is as important as understanding how they're constructed. Um, to not understand that would be to, to like, I don't know, to know how to drive, but not know the road signs. Not understand like how to get anywhere. Um, so it's really important for young people to be literate. Um, I teach a course where every kid gets a PS4 so they can be literate about games, right? You can imagine coming here and be like, I never played God of War. And you can't even begin to engage at a high level. Um, I think that all the things you mentioned, like AI, of course now, for young people, in order to even consider being, not even competitive, um, relevant, frankly, we have to provide systems, partnerships, where students can, you know, not just 
be exposed, but have the chance to iterate, which is what learning is, right? To, to get things wrong and grow. Um, that's how I feel. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks for going first. Um, so <laughs> for, from our perspective, my perspective personally, it's, it's I think, a huge opportunity that we've already been seeing on increasing access. Just a, a quick show of hands. How many of you use the Unity Editor? This is not a test, by the way. So we're at, we're at GDC, about a little under half, a third of you raised your hands, what, in San Francisco, California. Um, and if you just look at the Unity Editor, which I get full license to pick on, you have to have a computer that is like powerful enough to run it, and then you have to spend a couple hours downloading it. Then you have to actually figure out when you're like served with a blank screen, how to use it. You have to understand how to code. You have to understand digital art. You have to understand physics. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so we're already seeing with cloud and with streaming, just increased access to like lower end devices, um, the opportunity to be able to do it with less bandwidth. And then our view right now on AI, AI machine learning, which by the way, I, like, I have no idea. I just want to put that as the record. <laughs> but what we know today is that pretty soon we'll be able to take the coding part off of your plate. Pretty soon, we'll be able to help you create assets much more quickly than you have been before. And so our view is increasing access, increasing productivity, increasing opportunity. Yeah, I just want to say it's, it's kind of nuts sitting here. Um, I remember being at Cloud Gaming Summit with David Helgeson. Like, God, maybe like, <laughs> God, I don't even know what year it was. And I'm being like, I'm going to democratize game development. And then was like, what do you mean democratize? Like, this, this thing we're working on, everybody's going to have it. And actually to see... Like, to see it happen. Yeah, the things you get to see like in your lifetime. It's so, anyway, not about me, but it's interesting to see what access does, right? And then how people self-select for more learning when you give them access. And more to come. More access to come, hopefully. And more yeah. You heard it here, more to come. Yeah. More to come. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, let's go, uh, let's transition a little bit to Ali and Philip. And uh, we're going to think about how government agencies like, um, like New York City and, and nonprofits like Urban Arts how do you think about development as it relates to diverse and inclusive communities? Um, and what policies, initiatives, um, and have you seen that are particularly effective? Well, Ali and I go, you, you, me? So just to piggyback on uh, Jessica, we live and breathe and die, frankly, uh, metaphorically, in, the, in our ability to, to uh, work in schools and deliver top-notch programming to Title I schools across the country. And, our bit, and everything we do is just, you know, it just is a fact built on, we, we do it, we, it's all powered by unity and the ability to be able to go into low-tech settings and actually make things happen is a complete game changer for us. Um, but Aliyah and I, we go, we go a little bit way back. Um, we've been collaborating on uh, a project in New York City that's uh, basically just, so we, we, we were graduating Students often who would go to the to the big schools and get scholarships, but not all of them did. For some, those schools were unattainable, um, and so we graduated students uh, who would go into the CUNY system, City University of New York, biggest uh, university system in the country. Um, but there was not one four-year undergraduate game design degree, so our students would go and study adjacent subjects. So Aliyah and I have been working on that for a while, about three years, um, and we created the first ever this September. Um, undergraduate public option game design degree uh, where you can basically go and, and study uh, game design basically almost for free um, as part of the CUNY system. And that's a, a wonderful testament to you, Aaliyah, and your vision. Um, it gives our students a pathway uh, to go to college um, and you know, study with, without debt. It's a partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and um, CCNY, which stands for City College of New York, which is a historic college in Harlem. And by the way, on inclusivity, our programs are free to our students. I would say from a policy standpoint, that's always a good thing. We, let's work hard to make that possible. Right. Well, I guess just to piggyback on, on what Philip has said there, um, as government, we see ourselves as a connector. We see ourselves as um, an investor um, in, in this kind of um, thought leadership in the industry. Um, we organized an industry council. Um, we started convenings a few years back to understand what the ecosystem is in New York. 
that led to us establishing an industry council to inform how we should be moving as a city government to support um, growth in the industry. Um, and this initiative was our first um, step. And so, and so in making this investment in a public option um, makes the prospect of um, getting a, a post-secondary education in game design possible. Um, what we see is the track in New York City, which um, is similar in other urban environments, 72% of the students that attend public school in New York City go to public college in New York City. And so you can see that if we're going to affect the people that live in New York City, we have to engage with the public university system um, in the city in order to do that. And so that was, that was the first step um, in our approach to trying to support diversity in the industry. That's great. That's great and wonderful to hear. And just a quick poll, raise your hand if you've ever heard of New York City. <laughs> yeah, All right. I would say the majority of the room, that's great. Um, I'll acknowledge that it's been a wonderful opportunity to, to work with, with New York City and partners like we have on the panel today and, and hear the diverse perspective of industry, government, education, nonprofits. So it is, you know, part of, part of making all that happen is, is providing that forum. So just a great kudos to, to the leadership in New York City and the mayor's office of media and entertainment. What a, what a great opportunity to facilitate that type of discussion. Uh, with all that, let's, let's go on to the next pillar. Uh, the next pillar is building a strong talent pipeline. And we're going to talk about industry and academia um, collaborations, you know, strategies for a diverse talent pipeline, and how do we support game industry development. And, and with this one, I want to, you know, I don't know if you've read it, but Kevin Scott, uh, CTO of Microsoft, wrote a book called Reprogramming the American Dream. And in that book, he highlights the success with the Tectonic Academy. Um, and that's a nonprofit organization that partners with local businesses to provide software development training to people with, um, with diverse backgrounds. And this really demonstrates uh, how folks like we have on our panel today can come together to unlock the opportunity for students. Uh, we, we at Microsoft are always thinking aspirationally how we can do it, but we, it's more effective when you have uh, a, a team behind you that cares about the same things that you care about. So really eager to learn from our panelists how we think we or how they think we can work together even better to impact even uh, even more and, and elevate more creators. I'm going to start with this prompt for, for Gordon and Aaliyah. How can educational institutions like USC and agencies like the New York City Mayor's Office uh, collaborate to build a strong and diverse talent pipeline? Are there, are there initiatives that you've seen that have driven the most uh, impact when, when you're de developing, building, and encouraging students to go through these programs? Well, uh, uh, so the partnership, the partnership that um, you're hearing about today started with Philip and I having a conversation about what was affecting um, students in the urban arts program. So, I don't know, I think, I think he's, he's humble in talking about what they've been able to achieve, but they're reaching about 15,000 students a year um, in Title I schools with game education. Um, and so to me, you know, that's at the root of, that's at the root of the conversation. How do we reach these students and give them the opportunity to even see how do you make that game you've been playing? Have you thought about even approaching making the game you've been playing? Um, and um, that conversation led to understanding that they were highly successful at reaching those students, engaging those students, in, and, and getting them excited about um, developing games. But then, you know, the conversation um, led to, well, we're getting scholarships for this many students each year to actually go on to that private education um, and pursue careers in gaming. And I mean, I think about my own background. I went to college on scholarship. You know, that's how I'm sitting where I am, that I had this opportunity because. And so uh, 
that led to us having a conversation about how we connect to the public um, system, how we connect to city college. And, you know, in, in, in conversation with Gordon, just a little conversation with Gordon, I mean, we've had this talk about the fact that the, that the university system is so significant in, in uh, closing that gap. And I think that we're trying to find more ways to collaborate, but this being one of the first, Hostos, and I saw Juno come in here. I see her. Okay, so um, Hostos has been a pioneer in our public um, education system in New York City in establishing a game design associate's degree program, so the two-year degree program. And as a part of what we've um, invested in uh, with City College, that those students that are matriculating at um, Hostos will now have the ability to transfer all of their credits to City College and get the four-year degree if that's what they think is necessary in order to um, achieve the career objectives that they have in the industry. That's so cool. Um, wow, it's sort of emotional, so interesting. I think about this wonderful sort of generational change. Um, so there was a time when there was a lot of energy devoted to um, harvesting versus cultivating underrepresented people. By that I mean um, identifying the, the cream of the crop. And we'd be like, oh, we've identified the cream of the crop, dot, dot, dot. Um, which of course is not good news for the crop. Um, <laughs> and you know, as someone who you know, woke up in the crop, you go, oh wait, I might be the crop, my sister's the crop, my mom's the crop. You know? um, and it's so meaningful to see you know, pipelines, right? Even the language of that, like you're identifying um, <clears throat> democratization, like what you're doing, you know, urban arts, you know, the reach of it all um, and how important it is um, to increase the discovery of programs like this. Like even this discussion right now, like we're learning, you know, from each other and how do we get out, you know, to this community? Like how do y'all, you know, learn, connect, share information? Um, I know for us, um, like at USC, uh, we have the Jerry Lawson scholarships, right, to support underrepresented students. There's, um, but the disconnect between the price of the school and discovering that there's ways to solve that point of friction is actually very high. Um, I know that we have scholarships, like we do system, you know, with you, um, GDP, we do scholarships, but like getting kids, parents, families to collide, you know what Kaleidoscope is? Does everyone know Kaleidoscope? Raise your hand if you do not know what Kaleidoscope is when I say this. Okay, perfect, okay, okay. So, well, let's do the work in real time, right? There's a website called kaleidoscope.com where you can discover a whole world of scholarships. Like, we have scholarships open today, like cash grants, laptops for underrepresented kids. But, like, if y'all don't know Kaleidoscope exists, imagine how far away they are. You know, it's passionate 10 a.m. Friday. Unity, certifications resources for everyone available today. But if they don't, if we aren't able to build those sort of bridges um, where the crop is valuable, right? Not just the cream. Well, then it makes the work so much harder that we, that we all want to do. Anyway, we need to find more ways to share like this, like this panel, like, thank you, Josh. Like, because this is where the work happens. That's so important. That's all I want to say. Okay. Oh, sorry. Also, hi, Tammy. Hi, hi, MJ. So cool, like seeing your life like live here. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question exactly, oh. but like, um, there's like a meta, which is us having a relationship that goes past this hour. You know what I mean? Like, it not being like um, the Loch Ness monster. Like, we're here. Oh my God, education. But then can't find each other in a meaningful way, like for the rest of the year, that we need to address in a meaningful way. Oh, exactly. I think that's really, really well said, Gordon. And I think, you know, everybody, everybody up on the stage and everybody in the audience, you all have your own communities and your own partners and your own, you know, underserved students that, that, that can't access everything that they need. So, you know, I think that leads really well into sort of the next prompt. And it's really thinking about, you know, how do we be intentional? So I'll say to Jessica and, and Philip, uh, how, how do we be intentional in reaching communities? And, and what skills and competencies do you think are most important as we're reaching these communities? And how, how can we do it better, I guess? All right, I'll, di I'll dive in. Um, so the intentionality, I think there's um, one clear answer for that, which is quantify and hold ourselves accountable for it. 
Um, so when we went into kind of standing up the social impact strategy a few years ago, we looked at not just how do we have our employee base be as inclusive and diverse as possible, but actually how do we have our customer base be as inclusive and diverse as possible? And how do we set KPIs that we're compensated on um, for moving that needle? And so we have a goal of increasing the inclusivity of our customer base, so underrepresented creators by 5% each year, um, which is tied not only to my compensation, but our executive teams compensation and what they hold themselves accountable to. So I think that intentionality of the design is, is key in the, in the beginning. And at that point, I didn't know um, anybody <laughs> really on this stage a few years ago. And then through that intentionality, we were able to unlock the opportunities that exist. And I feel so privileged to be supporting the work of both USC and Urban Arts and a strong partner for Microsoft and supporting New York through, through the Urban Arts work that um, you're doing with creating this um, program, the getting an actual degree in game design at, at New York that didn't exist before in the universities. In addition to that, having you help us in creating an AP computer science experience and prep that like is much more engaging that our team couldn't do on our own. And so once we set this intentionality of we're increasing inclusivity and finding the right partners to help us achieve those goals, it really unlocked it. The, the other thing I wanted to say, um, Natalie's back in the back of the room. She leads our work on ecosystems. And so similar to what we are hearing with um, the mayor's office and with Urban Arts, we've really started seeing globally this increase in communities that want to collaborate from an ecosystem approach. And the diversity of the government incentives have, has been super exciting. So um, basically, how do we provide, the government's thinking about how do I provide tax incentives for industry to hire this underrepresented talent? Um, and that, that varies by community and how they're approaching it. But I think this intersection of government and how you unlock the community opportunity, collaborating with the universities and the nonprofit programs in the space and the industry to immediately hire has been critical because the unsolved problem that I think we all have in this pipeline is every employer wants somebody with two to three years of experience minimum. And we have hundreds of thousands of highly qualified people without that two to three years of experience. So how do we bridge that, that gap? And one other shout out, James can raise his hand. He's leading that on the Unity side. So if you have any employers who wanna work with us on apprenticeships, reach out to James too. Thanks. Mm. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't do our work without Unity. Jessica's alluding to, a, we, wrote a, a, we wrote and won uh, about a year ago, a federal grant called Game On, which is a project that um, so we look into, into the communities we serve and we saw that the AP Computer Science for the students we serve in Title I schools um, was taught in a, quite a dry way and obviously we can bring a lot of color and a lot of gamification to an AP course. And so we, we invented this program called Game On where we are teaching uh, A to Z, um, the AP CSP curriculum through game design and the federal government decided to invest in it and unity is essentially the wind beneath our wings on that because everything is built in edlab and so all of our students have edlab licenses and so that's just a fantastic partnership there the other in terms of talent pipelines um is anyone here work or run or just work in a not-for-profit setting few of you, okay. Well, we're always trying to raise money in not-for-profits. We're always trying to stay alive and hang on for dear life. Um, but uh, one, in terms of talent pipeline, one uh, uh, initiative we, we developed a couple of years ago during the pandemic when our students were very disconnected and when they were playing a lot of, vid playing a lot of video games and school really sucked, um, but also the video game industry was making a lot of money and perhaps also feeling quite disconnected, perhaps guilty for all the profits, I don't know. But um, we connected those two, two together and created a mentorship program um, between uh, employees of uh, game design development companies and our students. That has been absolutely incredible, not just because it provides value on both sides, it, it provides value for our students, yes, but it provides incredible value also for those employees and those developers. Um, and the, the symbiotic relationship between those, those two parties are really very, very powerful. Uh, mentorships have, you know, they, they were initially designed for eight to ten weeks. They've gone on for years. Um, and those, those mentors st have stayed with our students for years um, into, their, into their sort of workforce, uh, access to the workforce. So that's been very, very powerful 
in terms of, I think, talent pipeline. Mostly our mission is in high schools, we send kids to college, but there's that, that mentorship piece where we're really trying to um, make sure that we're sending our alumni off into a world where there's a lot of friendly people there. Yeah, I, just, I mean, I, it's interesting. Um, I see Jeff, hey Jeff, and I think about like Louisiana and my experiences there. I've been going to Louisiana for a long time and um, thinking about mentorship and how important it is to um, career pipeline versus job pipeline. I think there's one problem, which is like, how do you create less expensive labor for a job? Let's you know create a system in place so that you can have someone do a job in a new location for less, which is job development, which is different than career development, which is actually intent for you to be around for five years or 10 years or 20 years, where you need mentorship, right? Where urban arts, for example, I have my best essay, at USC, it was a kid from Urban Arts who's now in a different part of a career pipeline, you know, who started in New York City schools, right? Boom, boom, boom. Who's learning Unity, right? Who's now here at GDC, yeah. right? To, you know, to keep going. And um, I think that's a new dimension that's only happening now, where we're actually talking together about connecting the pipes, right? I think a lot of pipes of maybe even like you all have been around MJ for a minute, right? Time for a minute. There used to be lots of pipes that ended somewhere and then just poured people out into some situation. And then they, um, one more metaphor, I'll stop talking. So <laughs> for underrepresented people, I find that often we're like spaceships. And um, by that, I mean on the launch pad, we'll do something phenomenal. And you'll hear a story. Oh my gosh, you will never guess what insert person did. <laughs> It's so cool, it's amazing, against adversity, against all odds. We should give them an award or whatever. But it turns out that you need fuel in space. Like once you get up there, and if you don't have fuel, what happens is you just come back down to Earth, fall in the ocean, they put something else on the launch pad, okay? The space programs have all sorts of ground control and fuel and all sorts of features designed for them for space travel, which is different than the takeoff. Um, and so it's exciting to even see, even be in this conversation, which I know is about affecting people and retaining them and growing their value, their own innate value, not just, you know, extracting them from their situation. Oh, gosh. So love it and appreciate the, appreciate the thoughts and even thinking about this isn't just about the takeoff, but, you know, we are trying to impacts and empower creators through systematic change. And in order to do that, it's not just taking off. It's, you know, people, it's products, it's process, it's, it's politics, it's policy. So there's a lot of things that we can, that we can put together, which requires folks that we have on the stage to do in order to make that systematic change. So, so well stated. Moving on to our last pillar, the last discussion point before we open it up to a few questions is designing for game industry success. And we're going to think about the emerging, uh, the emerging needs and, and how the government and other education institutions are thinking about skills and certifications and how critical collaborations can unlock and empower creators through this, through this mechanism. And then we're also going to think about equitable, inclusive game development education. Um, and I'm going to talk about Tammy right here in the front. Uh, at the re recent Urban Arts Gala, yeah, Tammy, wave, make sure people see you. Um, Tammy was honored uh, and, and spoke about the importance of, of partnerships between industry, academia, and nonprofit organizations to build the inclusive and diversive pipeline um, uh, and making the impossible possible. So in our third and final discussion, designing skills and companies and certifications, we're gonna explore how game industry can collaborate to design effective curricula, <clears throat> certifications, skills, um, to really help the industry thrive and make that pipeline even better than it is today. So we're gonna start going with Philip and Gordon. Um, I know, yeah, you guys can fight it out who goes first this time. Um, I wanna think about what is, how do you measure the impact of these collaborations and how do you think looking forward with skills and certifications that it might evolve as you think about your work and, and how you're empowering the future creators? Well, I, I would never, we would never tell any of our students that college isn't an option, but we need to start looking into other options than college, number one. 
Um, and if we had all the money in the world, we would uh, create a, a parallel pipeline with our college access work. But um, I mean, certifications, uh, it's interesting. I talk about the AP computer science that we've, we're in year one of a five-year project and we're invested in it. But in conversations actually with Unity recently, um, there are only so many hours in the day. And one of the things that uh, we see as, as uh, tension, I suppose, is do you do the APCSP or do you take the Uni Unity certification? And we're listening to that very closely. Um, and obviously, we we're committed to what we're doing with the, with the AP Computer Science. But all of our students in our most advanced program take the Unity certified user exam. Um, and that is uh, a key sort of moment of, of uh, achievement for them. Uh, I would like to spread that across. I've been trying to figure out how to, how to do that in other artistic forms, like doing that with Adobe. I think all of those, uh, I'd love to see our students. Um, I'd love to have a, a very, um, how should I say, a certified certification program where those certifications really, really mean something and really uh, can advance our students. So I'm a big believer in it. We, we, we are just currently doing uh, Unity certifications, but I think that there's more there. Um, hmm. I think um, when I think about measuring, and I, it's, it's weird, it's like, you know, yeah, I've been in the games for 30 years. Um, this is a people business. Technologies evolve. You know, things, things change. What doesn't change are the relationships that you build along the way that give you the, the context to be successful, frankly. And I think that in the same way that college was historically important, because the only way that you could physically connect with people and, like, make connections that were meaningful or like your hometown. Well, now it's been democratized. We're all online, right? So urban arts, right? Where you can be connected remotely. The pandemic taught us all that we could all be connected in new meaningful ways, even if we weren't physically together in proximity. Um, I think that one of the measures of success is going to be years connected people. And by that I mean, like if you can keep people engaged, like flowers bloom in their time, um, Technology happens in its time, but if you can keep young people connected and engaged for a certain amount of time, well then they will be able to continue to iterate and bloom and grow as new things become available for them. If they become disconnected, and you can't unsee it when a young person gets disconnected, um, well then they don't have the chance to continue to bloom and grow and um, be self-sustaining. Um, and so I think when I think about it now and I look at young people that we're impacting, I sort of go, how long have they been connected to how many people who are oriented towards learning? And how can we create more of those yeah, years connected people, like as a unit of measure? Because we can always give them new information, right? Or new programs or new things, but only if they're engaged, right? Only if they're actually talking to each other and making the things which we can't do which only come from now young people's agency to in their education. Like, I want to learn it this way. Oh, okay. Big point. I'm a teacher, right? It used to be you come to class, chalkboard, very top down, right? Take the notes, A, B, C, D. Nah. Like today, my kids are on Discord the entire class, on their phones, learning and engaging in the way they want to learn and engage. And that is a part of the substance of it. Um, and that's not just in class. If you deal with young people, it's 24 seven now with device forever. And um, I don't know, it's up to us to sort of cultivate and feed that and then measure it in critical ways for yeah. the adults in the room. The other thing I'd say is sort of emerging out of the, the pandemic and coming back to hybrid and in-person learning. Uh, the thing we saw very obviously, and it's so obvious is what we call SEL, social emotional learning in, in, uh, in education, soft skills. And, and our curriculum had gotten so technical, so focused on skill development, and kids didn't know each other's names. And, and so, that, so, so that's the other reminder. You talk about agency and you talk about all of that. It just sort of smacked us in the face as to hang on a minute, we need to really focus a lot of time and energy on this as well. Yeah, I'll talk about Unity for a second. So what's neat about Unity for young people is it something they have in common before they know each other? A way to share interactions and share technology and share ideas and share experiences. Um, that it'd be almost like if everyone was musical when I was coming up. 
and we could all learn to sing and people could sing in different degrees, but we all know a song, right? Like unity is like that for games, hmm. for, you know, for play where you're like, oh, you sing, I sing too. I might sing more different or better, but we're able to all get it where we are if you have computers and time and access. Mm -hmm. But we're able to begin to engage around play, which everyone has now. Let's say we, we had TV um, from the start, and it's super meaningful, right? The kids in your pipeline, like, like New York's not monolithic. Like I grew up in New York, it's not a monolith, right? But what could be monolithic is I grew up in New York and I know Unity, right? I grew up in New York and I was in an urban arts program. Whatever borough or school or number, blah, 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 blah. Like we have a commonality, mm -hmm. which is... Once again, new to this generation, it's so cool. Great, great thought starter. And I, I, you know, one of the things that we thought about at Microsoft, particularly in education, was you know, helping folks stay connected, especially during the pandemic. It was a, a, a huge challenge. How do you facilitate community within the pandemic, right? So when when remote, when learning what remote, what does that mean? So. I'm gonna throw a little bit of a curveball to Jessica and Aaliyah, so sorry, but I wanna know from your perspective, building on what Philip and Gordon just said, how do you all, from an industry perspective, Jessica, and from a, a government perspective, think about facilitating community through these programs, through these people? Yeah, very, very deliberately. Um, community is just a key, a key strategy that embeds all of our programming. So actually once a month, um, yeah, this community like USC and Urban Arts are on a call together with all of uh, the rest of our um, partners in this work, sharing best practices and then continuing on Discord <laughs> all the time afterwards to be able to, to build off of each other. Um, and then I think also what we're trying to do in the global community aspect of this is bring in the ecosystem aspect of it too. So there's just a huge amount that we're learning from our government partners and, and how they're um, thinking about the work and what they want for industry. And to answer your earlier question too, on just like technically, how are we going through this? Um, if you are, if you want and you are privileged enough to access a four-year degree and that's the path that you wanna take, of course, you know, we've got big programming to support that. If you are not, or you wanna spend a lot less time and get into the industry more quickly, we work with all of our, um, not all of our, we have an employment advisory board that works with us to be able to backward map what they see both on the technical and soft skills side around what's required. And that's what creates all of our learning pathways on learn.unity and certifications so that you can take a much more cost-effective, efficient path into um, opportunity. Oh, um, on the question of community, uh, we have spent um, a lot of time and energy um, engaging all of the alumni in our programs. Uh, you know, uh, Made in New York is our trademark. Um, and it started with a program called uh, the Made in New York Production, Ass Production Assistant Training Program uh, 16 years ago. That program now has over a thousand alumni. Those alumni are all engaged and in a collective. They meet annually. They have a big festival. Um, and so each of the programs that we've established since then now feeds into that Made in New York alumni community. So all of, all of the students that participate in our programs, all of the people that graduate from those programs are encouraged to feed back into um, that community and then hire from and pull from that community. And so we've seen a lot of success in that, that someone who started by being a production assistant on a film 15 years ago is now hiring PAs from the program. Um, and so we, we have now translated that into everything else that we do. Um, we established a Made in New York animation project five years ago, uh, and that was a way to engage students. During the pandemic, that was the community for a lot of students in New York City to be able to log on and learn about animation, but really engage with their friends. I mean, that's the reason why they were joining those um, rooms during the pandemic. Um, and since then, now that we're back um, 
IRL, uh, that, that uh, they're still gathering in order to find community in building um, the, the games that they're building, in, in designing the um, films that they're designing. It's all about community. Um, to your other question about certification, uh, we have invested in badging systems because we realized at a certain point that um, in, in this creative space that we exist in, carrying your portfolio with you is as important as, or more important even, than showing someone a resume of all of the places that you've worked at. And so um, that was one of the things that we thought was important in establishing some, a system of credentialing that would allow you to carry your portfolio with you electronically. And so we've worked on a badging system um, in, in the film and television space. Uh, it's called Media Makers. And now, you know, in, in the gaming space, this is what we're working on with Urban Arts, is trying to create this badging system where your badge is really connecting uh, your portfolio to employers that are interested in looking at you. And so that's one of the ways that we want to continue to track um, development of our program is how many people have earned those badges, how many people have been able to establish their portfolios um, to carry with them. That's awesome. Thank you so, so much. And I appreciate your agility with, with questions. Uh, we have five minutes. I'm going to, I will open up. Do you have a question? So there's a mic if, if we might have time for one or two questions. So go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my name is Lauren Mandelker. I'm the new global manager for corporate social responsibility at Keyword Studios. Uh, and thanks. It's me. Right. Right. Don't back. leave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Live your uh, life. <laughs> so my, my question is about accessibility. Uh, we're talking very much in a U.S context, accessibility being not only limited to cost of education, but also folks knowing that it's available. Uh, I'm curious from you in a more global context where education is not as expensive, let's say in other, in other parts of the world, what other barriers do you see uh, between people and accessibility to growing and furthering their careers in gaming? Um, well, <laughs> um, well, one discovery. Um, to um, social norms, like expectations, right? Like I think the expectation that you are going to thrive in this space um, is one of those core things is being able to model behavior where you're able to see a reflection of yourself, right? And where you want to head, right? If you can't, you know what I'm saying? You can't, whatever, conceive it, you can't achieve it. You can't see it, you can't be it. Yeah, you can't see, you can't be it. So I think how do we distribute um, more diverse models of, of across gender, neurodiversity, socioeconomic background, um, race, gender expression, all that, um, that people can model after globally, right? Because the things you have in common aren't always geographic, right? They're more psychographic. And um, I think that's sort of part of our challenge. I think now that, I think we've grown out of the competitive aesthetic, like when I came up as a like, EA Sports, like now we all look to work together intuitively and now we sort of lift together additively um, to, to, to talk about what you're talking about, which is how can people who are maybe far away from an opportunity, not because of cost, but because of other factors, um, how do we help get, how do we build those bridges? Um, I think that's a challenge we all share. Um, like we put stuff on YouTube, you can see it everywhere. Right, something in Unity, you could get it anywhere, but you still need more pieces of that bridge to get to a job or to get to a career or to get to mentorship, for example. Thank you Thank so you very much. much. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kai Naomi. Um, hi, Gordon. Um, I am um, a USC Games undergraduate alum um, and have started an indie studio, so I am that. Childs, I am the person who had that like resource and that help in that pipeline. Um, and so I think the thing that really struck me when I was listening to this talk is that this is a sponsored session. So this is something that anyone with an expo pass can access. This is something that'll go in the vault. This is something that people can actually 
like watch later and it's archived in a meaningful way. Um, if you could, from your guys' expertise, give that list of those resources that the youth that are currently trying to go through the system need, and you could say that on this panel, um, I would love for that to be archived as well. Great suggestion, thanks. I think we're doing it right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, you got that right. The, yeah. Well, well, part of it is uh, we do have some follow-ups as part of a follow-up slide where we're archiving at least some of the resources that are publicly available to everyone. Um, so these are accessible resources, um, and you know we'll, we'll we'll share this so that yeah. we can absolutely have that. I would also say um, out there, add us all on LinkedIn, right? In case things happen in the future even though we're in the now, right? By the time you see this video, wherever you are, if you add us on LinkedIn, we are 1,000% devoted to getting you the information of the time, right? So as a resource like brute force, add us on LinkedIn. Our names are in the things, right? They'll be able to find it on the internet. Or wait, watch, what's your name? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Gordon Bellamy. Jessica Lindell. <laughs> Philip Courtney. Right. <laughs> You awesome. might not want to rewind. Um, I, I guess I guess I would add I would add um, the two programs that I've been talking about um, that we have invested in. Gaming Pathways is the name of the program that is the partnership between Urban Arts, um, City College of New York, and the Harlem Gallery of Science, the Harlem Gallery of Science, um, and Hostos. But, uh, that's, that's one program called Gaming Pathways, and you, go to, you, you can go to gamingpathways.org to find out more about that program. Um, the other is the Made in New York Animation Project, um, and you can go to our website, which is nyc.gov slash M-O-M-E. Yeah, go to urbanarts.org, and any student can apply to our program, and it's free. Yeah, and for us, um, we have our gaygamingpros.org. Org, and we have usc.edu um, and the Jerry Lawson Scholarship to look up as well. Um, and go, go to Kaleidoscope, all of you in the room, not future person, but all of you here, kaleidoscope.com. We have scholarships today for underrepresented people. You could be like right now on your phone and starting to get money and stuff for your people that you care about right now, kaleidoscope.com. Love it. All right. Thank and so we much. are at time, so I know there's a couple more folks, but you know, I'd encourage you to come up after the session and connect with, with, with some of the panelists. But I, uh, we do have to bring this session to a close. So as we close, I first want to express my gratitude to the amazing panelists. So we have Aaliyah, uh, Gordon, Jessica, and Philip. So, so excited that, it, that you were able to join us today and, and thankful for your, your contributions and strategies and looking at how we can give more pathways for students to, to be creators and, and building our talent pipeline for future future creators. I also want to thank, you know, attendees. You know, I'd encourage you to to think about the resources. On the last slide, we put a couple different things. You know, success comes with collaboration, understanding people in your community that care about the same things and, and aligning people, processes, products, um, and politics in order to unlock opportunities for, for your students and, and, and for your community. Embrace new technologies. You know, it's been a wild six months. Uh, uh, so think about all the emerging technologies and how they could change the way that you that the way you think, the way you do things, how you can be more efficient. Invest in education. I know that seems I'm, I'm certain that most people in this room agree with that sentiment on face value. But be as, as we talked about in the in the discussion, be intentional. Being intentional is, is really important and is going to, if you have more specific KPIs, you're going to have more specific outcomes and that's going to be more powerful for who you're trying to empower. Uh, pervert, pr uh, promote diversity and inclusion, super important, is uh, thinking about, again, being intentional with the communities you're, you're targeting. And, and then finally, innovate with purpose. You know, uh, innovation is a, a word that gets thrown around a lot now in, in modern times, but thinking about, again, what are the outcomes that you're, you're trying to drive toward and what can you do? And then finally, I just want to express gratitude for everybody that, that uh, not only everybody that came here, but but Xbox for making this a, a, a sponsored discussion. We think it's really important to, to think about all the different parts of, of our ecosystem that we've said a few times, you know, government, higher education, industry, and nonprofits to really unlock the, the future potential for, for the creators and, and the future of game development. So thank you all for attending today. All right.